afternoon, everyone. It is lovely to be here uh, this afternoon. And thank you very much to CAMS for inter inviting me to speak here. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Tate's collection, what it looks like today, how it's changing, and what these changes mean for an institution such as Tate, for our audiences, and for, as today I said earlier, for the art world as a whole. So um, Tate was founded, the first Tate Gallery, and its initial collection found life thanks to some powerful men wanting to flex the cultural muscles of a small but economically powerful island. The gallery, Tate Britain as we now know, now know it, was the original Tate and it was founded primarily by a gift by a single artist, Turner. We hold still more than 30,000 works, Turner's papers, drawings and paintings, as the foundation for our collection. At the time, um, the painter, James Oruk, wrote in the English Times newspaper, a wealthy country like ours ought to be able to stop the mouth of foreign critics with a representative and choice collection. The time has come for the creation of a great British gallery. And, as I say, with Turner's foundational gift and philanthropy from Henry Tate to help build our original building, the gallery was born. Fast forward 125 years, and we are still really preoccupied with the idea of what a representative and choice collection should look like. But now, in the context of a radically different relationship with the world and the global art ecology. So, at the present time, Tate has a world-leading collection of uh, just a little over 80,000 works of art, this collection is used by us. It's loaned out nationally and internationally all the time. There are 1,500 works currently circulating the globe from Tate's collection helping other people's exhibitions. We show 10,000 of our own works across our four galleries each year. We hold the National Collection of British Art, which begins in 1500, comes through to the present day, as well as an international modern and contemporary art collection. In the past decade, this collection has become resolutely global and transnational. Our mission, set by government, is to collect works of the highest quality that reflect the art of the past and the present as we see it today. Beneath this broad and benign canopy, of course, we are always in flux and always debating what this collection should look like. To me, a truly relevant and representative collection must both reflect the art ecology and help shape it, and also shape global museum practice and thinking. So in my presentation today, briefly, I will share some examples of how we're attempting to do this. Thank you very much. I'm shorter than previous speakers. Put simply, our collection informs our gallery displays and our exhibitions, and this in turn sets the tone for who walks through our doors. Our vision is to make the collection, our program, and our audience more diverse, more adventurous, more inclusive of the wide spectrum of artistic practice that we see today, and also more um, inclusive for a wider range of audiences. The days of someone seeing the grand porticoed facade of Tate Britain and feeling, it's not for me, I hope are long gone. And whilst this drive to diversify has been at the heart of our activities for some long time, the climate emergency, recent global rallying cries around racial justice and equity issues have shifted things, I think, in a very good way, much faster. So to give a single example, um, this portico, to me, does not look as um, terrifying as it might once have done 125 years ago. It's a winter commission by the uh, Punjabi Liverpudlian artist, uh, Shaila Berman. In the midst of a very grim winter lockdown in the UK, her celebration of Scouse Punjabi popular culture and her feminist reappropriation of Hindu deities became the rallying place for London 
a city that was hungry for social and cultural connections, but was really only allowed to do those outside. So, outside Tate Britain, family reunions, wedding proposals, first dates, taxi tours, all took place under her neon illumination. Moving forward to now, exhibitions like Cornelia Parker's current retrospective, this is her great work, Cold Dark Matter, An Exploded Shed, which is in Tate's collection, an exhibition which is deeply playful, but also very political, is welcoming um, fantastic numbers of visitors. At Tate Modern, Beyond Borders, our global surrealism show, address it addresses a classic art historical movement, surrealism, but through a genuinely global lens. So here, uh, Dali's Lobster Telephone, one of Tate's collection works, meets a different kind of sea dreaming in um, Ramsey's Yunnan work from um, the later 60s, looking at how the complex story of surrealism moved around the globe. So for our collecting strategy, what does this mean? To put it simply, I would say we are collecting less, but more strategically, and in a worldly way, to use that fantastic phrase by Homi Baba. So less comprehensive, more with a diverse world in mind, and with the concerns of our own time squarely addressed. Questions of equity, whether that be racial, gender, class, or sexuality, questions of the climate emergency are all being explored alongside the aesthetic and historical importance of the works we bring into the collection. So we're thinking how we build a collection mindfully in an era where resources, in every sense of the word, are becoming more scarce. It's not growing the collection for the sake of growth, but rather it is about expanding the stories we hold and tell through the collection. The excitement of the first decade of the 21st century at Tate was largely felt in the rapid expansion then of the international collection that underpins the programme of Tate Modern, which was then a newly created space. This was typified by a movement away from a largely European and North American canon towards a transnational understanding of the interconnected evolution of 20th and 21st century art across all continents. With consistent leadership from my colleague Francis Morris, who was then director of collection and is now director at Tate Modern, women artists were shown and made their way forcefully into the collection. So this piece by Eileen Agar is in the Surrealism Show. She, along with artists like Louise Bourgeois, Agnes Martin, Kusama, had strong solo shows. They are now market leaders, as well as stalwarts of a rewritten art history. So now, with even more urgency, we ask ourselves, how do we shape a collection that resonates with a wider demographic of visitors in our gallery, with visitors online, because we are much more international than we ever were, and with visitors across the world as we take our exhibitions on international tours. We are therefore actively choosing to shift the narrative of art history to become less white and Western-centric. We are regendering the canon, and we're embracing the diverse centers of art making that existed always, but are being recognized much more fully now. So, to give you just a few brief examples, in recent years, artists like Romare Bearden, so important in terms of early 20th century African-American history, are now in the collection. You see shaman shamanic performance and fiber artist, Cecilia Vicuna from Chile, hanging alongside shamanic Joseph Boyce from Germany, Cecilia finds her place in the Venice Biennale and will be in the Turbine Hall um, uh, as our new Hyundai Commission in September. So all of this, um, you see F.N. Sousa's work um, central to the story of London art in the 1950s. So we are telling a more inclusive and diverse history of our collection and our world. 
And when we think about this transnational context, it affects also our British collection. I'd like to invoke the words of the great Sir Salman Rushdie, who has been much in all of our minds in recent weeks. He said, the trouble with the English is that their history primarily happened overseas, so they don't really know what it means. Rushdie's provocation is fascinating when we think of shaping the story of British art over five centuries, which is what Tate is charged with doing. But rather than telling this story of a heroic and nostalgically depicted marooned island nation, we are instead thinking about a globally connected history that looks transparently at difficult questions of Britain's empire and its colonial history. So for visitors last autumn, they saw a much more diverse concept of Britishness presented in the Tate Britain exhibition, Life Between Islands. It was a game changer for us at Tate Britain, exploring the extraordinary breadth and influence of Caribbean British art from the 1950s to the present day. The show featured seven major new acquisitions, reflecting our com uh, commitment to strengthening representation of Caribbean British artists in our national collection. These works ranged from those artists who came as part of the so-called Windrush generation. Windrush was the name of the, the main ship that brought people over from the Caribbean. And they came to Britain and found their home in the art schools in London in the 1950s and 60s. So, for example, Paul Dash. We brought this self-portrait into the collection. You'll note he presents himself um, with his easel as an artist self-representing, largely because of the racism that he encountered on arrival with people within art schools telling him he couldn't be an artist. So he moved from that first breakthrough generation to more recent artists who made such an impact on the British art scene in the 70s and 80s. This is Ingrid Pollard's Oceans Apart. Ingrid has been nominated as one of the Turner Prize artists this year. To this fantastic contemporary work by Ender G.Q. Crosby, which was shown first as a piece of public art in Brixton Tube Station. Brixton is the historic center of the African Caribbean community in London, um, and this work has now been recreated as a collection work, which is in Tate's collection. As you can see, it depicts a gathering of grandchildren from the Windrush generation, surrounded by patterned wallpaper, furniture, and pictures that recall their grandparents. The topicality of a work like this is very potent at a time in the UK when the abuses suffered by this Windrush generation are still coming to light. It's representative too in the way that it speaks to the intergenerational audience, audiences we hoped to attract to the show. And it worked for us. This exhibition was the first that we have seen at Tate where the demographic of our paying visitors matched that of London which means the show was seen by an almost 50% black and minority uh, ethnic audience. So, exhibitions drive collections and collections drive exhibitions. We're in the process now of acquiring a body of new works for a 2023 exhibition at Tate Britain called Women in Revolt. So, subject close to my heart. This uh, um, show will surface the work of the highly productive, politically engaged generation of female artists working between the 1970s and 1990s. Um, they really ch they paved the way for the current generation of female artists. But until recently, you would not have seen their work at an art fair, nor would you have seen them in mainstream museums. In fact, we rather looked down on craft-type processes like this. This is currently on show in Tate Liverpool. But as we've seen in recent editions of Freeze and now in institutions, this has been challenged. And these kinds of works move from specialist feminist spaces into the mainstream so that all audiences can feel the heat and politics of these incredible works. We will, through this show, focus particular attention on the blocks there have been historically for women of colour being shown within collections. And so I want to note Sonia Boyce,
whose um, first work came into Tate's collection in 1987, I'm pleased to say, but this work came through the support of the Freeze Fund, which through Endeavour sponsorship allows us to work to acquire contemporary arts from the Freeze Art Fair each year. And it has been a way in which we have been able to pursue the current issues of our time. So this piece, Audition, um, is, as you can see, uh, an installation of black and white photographs, headshots of people with natural afros or wearing afro wigs. It addresses a whole complex set of issues around identity and stereotype. And bringing a work like this into Tate's collection is part of our deliberate attention to addressing the relative lack of work by those influential black British artists of the 70s and 80s. So also from Freeze, we acquired this wonderful Claudette Johnson. In more recent times, we have been bringing Keith Piper's work into the collection so that we fully um, express the range of British art um, from the later 20th century. There are also huge challenges for any collecting policy in terms of thinking through the climate emergency. This work is Moss Wall by Olafur Eliasson. Many of you will be familiar with his work and he has a long history of combining exhibition with climate activism through partnership work with Tate. We have to use our spaces to amplify the concerns of our time that are also, of course, the concerns of artists. And we also have to act as a sector leader advocating for change within the museum sector in terms of our approach for, to collections. I cannot say this more strongly. For an institution whose four public galleries face rivers and seas, you know, you can see the river and the sea from all of our galleries. The issues of rising sea levels and extreme weather that we have experienced this past summer are no longer a future threat. They are a present reality. So these kinds of concerns must reflect how we think about our collection. I want to end with a final example, um, which talks about how institutions have to change themselves. Until three years ago, Tate had collected no work by indigenous artists from any continent. And like many art museums, we were still working with very outdated assumptions that such practice were largely collected by anthropological museums. This, I'm glad to say, is no longer the case, and our collecting policy active, actively identifies indigeneity as a critical focus for the collection. Works by artists from Latin and North America, Australasia, and Northern and Eastern Europe um, are now making their welcome presence felt in the collection. But this does require us to change how we do things. So this is a work, um, even more recently acquired from the Freeze Art Fair. It's by Edgar Kallel. He is a Mayan Cachaquel artist from Guatemala. Its title is The Echo of an Ancient Form of Knowledge. When it was presented at Freeze, the rocks were sourced by the artist in, from Surrey. Um, he wanted their natural looking appearance. They became altars, um, a space for sacrifice of the cutting of fruit. Um, the fruit came from Brixton Market again. And a ritual was conducted by a member of the Maya Cachaquel community without which the work could be not, could not, was not complete. So there's a connection to ancestral practice and local indigenous communities. He would say the work is a visual chant or a poem. There's no precise word for visual art in my Kachakel um, language. He wants us to consider the complexity of indigenous cultural life. He also asserts that the work cannot be owned. So this poses something of a problem in terms of buying a work from an art fair. Um, we had to change all of our thinking. The artist invited Tate to become the custodian of the work for 13 years, uh, and our 13 is a significant number in the Mayan calendar, after which we can renew custodianship or choose with the artist to return the work to Earth. So we've entered into a knowledge-sharing agreement with the Maya Cachaquel people. It required the agreement of all of my trustees and it's a huge shift 
because an ownership-based 125-year-old organization is agreeing to form a different kind of relationship, emotional and political, with an indigenous community. So that um, uh, asks us to think how we need to be different for the future. I want to close, I know I'm over my minutes, but I'll be very swift, um, just to return to Korea and transnational concerns. Tate is lucky enough to hold many works by Nam June Pike. Widely considered to be the founder of video art, a pioneering figure, you all know this. We were delighted to be able to present his work as a major exhibition in 2019. We were also able in 2014 to begin an incredibly exciting partnership with Hyundai and with our Asia Pacific Acquisitions Committee to acquire nine works at once, which were the foundation of that exhibition. Without those works in the collection, we would not have been able to do the show. Just today, a journalist from Seoul told me of accounts of Korean people weeping as they saw that in London with pride and excitement that their artist was being shown in our spaces. So I just wanted to underline the significance and importance of those transnational exchanges. We have come a very long way indeed since my forebears sought to display a pet, uh, find a space to display old masters for mostly to be old men to see. Our collections now speak of many worlds and lives and we can't tell these multiple histories without truly global artistic exchange. So we are striving for mutual knowledge sharing and through that re reaching a wider public and creating more equitable relationships between museums across the world. And so we are not interested in creating new outposts for Tate, but rather a different set of evolving relationships based on knowledge sharing. There's no start and end point for this work, and Tate has an enormous amount to learn in this journey, and we will do things wrong along the way, I am certain but I am very proud of the progress that's been made within my institution and in the wider sector. And I'd like to thank all of you today who are supporting this transformative work. Just a few words to start. The François Pinot is a self-made man and started to collect more than 45 years ago as a passion, as a risk, and being very personally involved since then. Uh, he didn't thought at all to open public spaces at the time. Uh, that happened. Uh, and he gave his business parts to his son and had more time since 20 years to be personally involved. Uh, in general, we are very linked with the artists, and when an artist comes into the collection, we follow up. I decided to show you the opening show of the Bourse de Commerce, which could finally open a year ago uh, because of uh, COVID, etc. You all witnessed all that. Uh, the opening show was called Open, uh, and it reflects very well the collection. Uh, we have two other spaces in Venice, which you can uh, hope you can see, which is dedicated to two monographic exhibitions, Marlene Dumas, who's a fantastic artist originally from South Africa, who lives in Holland, in Amsterdam, and a very radical uh, artist called Bruce Nauman, and the show we did with uh, Carlos Basualdo from the Philadelphia Museum uh, is around uh, studio sound and body, so quite uh, the opposite of objects. Um, so also the opening show of the Bourse de Commerce was signed by François Pinot, so he's been very involved since the beginning of it. The, this is the space, uh, which is uh, again a dated space. This is Charles Ray, it's a monographic show we did after an American um, uh, artist. Uh, this is a French artist called Martial Reis that François Pinot followed for the past 20, more than 20 years, which is the opposite of a fashion artist. So it's a way to be involved with people of his generation without and being distant from uh, what we call fashion or movements. Uh, 
I go a bit quickly. This is some place works that we placed in the building, including Maurizio Catana, to give a, keep a sense of humor and thinking also of the uh, younger people coming into the space. Uh, Oh, sorry, I see everything in front, sorry. Uh, Urs Fischer, it's uh, an artist of the collection and it was a work of the collection, but what you see on the top, which is a painting which was made for the opening of the Bourse de Commerce of the Time in 1889 for the International Universal Exhibition, and it reflects so much the colonial time. So Urs Fischer decided to, we decided to, to, to extend the, the work which was first shown in Venice, having uh, details of chairs that he borrowed from the Cape Branly Museum, which is a result of the colonial time, mixed with the most contemporary chairs. Everything is in candles, so disappeared, and it's the opposite of a monument for the entrance. It's about something which disappear, and time is very, um, uh, how to say, uh, something that we have to challenge all the time. This was the vitrines. I want to go to David Hammonds, who's an artist that Francois Pinot decided to start to collect more than 30 years ago uh, from America. Um, a black artist who changed a lot of things for a lot of younger generation, uh, starting from his own culture instead of uh, trying to integrate and making works with uh, what he found in the streets, uh, the reality of the black community, which was absolutely not recognized at the time. It would be impossible to do today such a collection uh, with the works from the 70s up to today. Uh, David Ammons is very specific. He's refusing any institution exhibition. Uh, and for this, in that case, uh, we said at the beginning that we were going to show the belongings. It's the first uh, monographic exhibition of David Hammonds in France and even in Europe, who is a lot less known than in the States. Um, we were a bit afraid, this is a video, <laughs> a bit afraid of the reaction because it's challenging as a artwork. Uh, but we were very amazed how the reaction of the public was understanding the work, feeling even the work of David Hammonds. He participated at the, in the from distance because of COVID thing we could not of course, having him flying in, uh, and he would not fly anyway. And it shows you how the, the rural culture, uh, he's still in Harlem and his neighborhood, make him having works. So it's been, uh, we were super proud to be able to put, do that together and to have the agreement of David um, himself at the end with a, a very specific work which will be at the end of the, which is this, which he kept for more than 16 years, which was never shown, and he agreed to have it uh, with us, and it was the last work of his in the, um, in the exhibition. It represented a cell, uh, and it's the size of the cell, and the cell in America, uh, in the States, in mainly uh, uh, with, the mix, with the Mexican or the black artists, so it's a real reality, and it's the size of the cell of the condemned people. He kept the stone, um, because it's from where the, um, the, the prison was. This is a photographic gallery. We spoke about woman position. We are quite engaged with women and engagement. This is Martha Wilson. In between, she just had a small show in Bobo, uh, but she was quite unknown, uh, speaking about gender and queer things, as well as Michel Journiac, who's a French artist. Uh, playing who died of AIDS. Uh, the whole show was about the idea of virus and AIDS virus. Uh, this is Louise Lawler, which is an important American artist, just to show you part of the uh, photographic collection. <laughs> um, and it's an engagement against the Elms Amendment. Uh, to make it very quick, it was a, a decision to uh, forbid any money to public help against AIDS. And uh, we had a lot of similar question because of the, of the coronavirus, at least in, in Europe. All that show was thought before the coronavirus. Um, I go a bit quicker 
uh, so you can see that it also in the photographic collection, when we start a collection, we go deep. And Cindy Sherman is since a long time in the collection. Both of those artists, it would, uh, David Hammonds or Cindy, it would be impossible to, do a, to have today such a, a collection. I want to go, on the, this is to give you an idea of the space. Uh, on the second floor of the Bourse de Commerce, where we had decided also before COVID to make an exhibition around the idea of figures and in which we included younger artists. Uh, Stingle is uh, an Italian-American artist, which is also very much into the collection and to the art of uh, François Pinot, we dedicated him a solo show in, in the Palazzo Grazzi. And this is three figures which changed his life. A link with history with Kirchner, a link with her, his main gallery, his first show in New York, Paula Cooper, and his best friend who sadly disappeared, Franz West. This is uh, to give you a taste. So Claire Tabouret is a young French artist who moved now to Los Angeles. Uh, with, uh, she made those self-portraits with the doubt of what can we do in those times. Uh, her life changed since we pay attention with her and we help her to move to Los Angeles where she lives now. Uh, Xini Cheng is a young Chinese artist we follow for more than five years even, even if she's young. Uh, we made a selection together to show her and we, this is really much the collection to mix in between more established and younger uh, artists. Dinette, for the English talker here, is, she's quite known in, in England. She's coming from, from England, and we started with her also six years ago. And it's mixed with a lot more known artists like Peter Doig. Um, and the display was making rhythm in between yo younger and older. This is Marlene Dumas, which I just raised. Uh, which we, she is quite deep in the collection. This was the youngest artist of the whole show, called Serre Serpa. She was 24 when we did the opening show. Uh, and again, all of them, we follow them, we go to the studios, and compared to big institutions that we also have in, in France, uh, like Beaubourg, we are in complement. We don't, uh, we're not competing at all. It's the idea that we give uh, sets and visibility to newer and older one. Kerry James Marshall is a fantastic uh, artist from Chicago. Uh, he had an amazing show at the Metropolitan and he changed uh, a lot of today's uh, position. He's obviously black. A, there were a lot of questions about black people. We again decided that uh, before COVID, before all those, um, those movements and even before Black Lives Matter, and all, again, François Pinault, who is very, very much a visionary, started to uh, collect him more than 20 years ago. It's um, not easy to have a work by him today. Uh, and he's incredible in the way of making a painting. You had even the, the smell of the situation where you were in front of his work. Um, sorry to go that fast, but I see the time running <laughs> uh, on, the, on the figure. Uh, they're very different size and deepness. Um, the following galleries is Luc Thomas, which is a Belgian painter. We also did two years ago a monographic show in Venice at the Palazzo Grazzi. Um, he does not, he's obsessed with the question of the threats of today's and he's very uh, concerned with the presence of fascism in uh, Germany. All his paintings are pre-thought and he does them in one evening. If it's not succeed, he just, uh, they destroyed. Miriam Kahn, she's a, some, a fantastic Swiss uh, woman. She's probably 65. She will be shown in freeze, uh, having, not afraid of anything. She's a bit like Marlene Dumas, who's for me an incredible example to not be afraid and to engage with a woman's question, political question, necessity, urgencies. Um, so we did the installation. It's a very specific installation. So we did that together by Zoom. And uh, in that room, uh, the younger artist which will follow is Antonio 
Oba uh, from Brazil. And it was important for us that during the whole uh, show on the second floor, we could you could see different faces, different origin, different colors, different belongings. And we were quite proud that a lot of the public, when they visited that first show, were to, uh, saying it is our house. Uh, and this was important for us. The last room is with three generation and the only dead person, but a very important for us, um, a uh, German painter called Martin Kippenberger who was quite radical and against the idea of a, an object very critical. Uh, Thomas Schutter, who's an incredible uh, figurative uh, sculpture with a lot of uh, possible Id identifications mixed with, um, uh, sorry, getting quicker, mixed with Florian Kruer was the last of the young ones, so the whole exhibition was punctuated in between known and unknown, and Florian Kruer, we follow since 2018, um, is German also, but with the street language as an obsession, and being very involved with the queer communities, he moved now to um, New York, and, and very involved with those necessities. The, the, this is the end of the, I go quickly, uh, uh, with the video. So in general, the collection, w there is a video um, collection, which I did start before in 1998, 2001. There's the photographic collection, which is also on its own and with a creator called Mathieu Humry who runs it, with the same idea of ensemble or um, big collection of for example, Cindy Sherman, but Cartier-Bresson. And uh, we dedicated um, the, the underground rooms on, at the Bourse de Commerce uh, with a video space, and this time it was a, a work by Pierre Rigue of Spring. Pierre Rigue uh, is uh, an amazing French artist, but living abroad. And Tarek Atawe, which is a sound uh, installation coming from Lebanon, and he made all those research, the different elements with the ceramics, uh, following a trip he did in China. So he's been very involved with different practice. To um, finish, so Tatiana Trouvé, uh, she made those sculptures which she calls guards and the whole exhibition were with the guards all around. I'm going to just give you a few numbers. <laughs> so the collection is uh, more than 10,000 works. We had done more than 34 exhibitions. The exhibition in general are either monographic based on the, the artists that we follow. When it's a monographic show, of course, we uh, borrow. It's not just a collection. We did 16 exhibitions outdoors, which means a, an institution, a city or a museum asks to have a Pinot collection. And we did one in Seoul in 2011. <laughs> uh, that was my first time. <coughs> We do a lot of loans, especially for the monographic exhibition when the, the artist is asking or to help. And we had more than 350 artists shown up to now. My time is over, but uh, <laughs> very happy to share and thank you very much. Gasmida, 어, 저희 미술관에서도 어, 아주 큰 경사를 맞게 되었습니다. 제가 소장품가로 부임했을 당시에 그 소장품이 한 8,800점 여점이었는데 단번에 저희가 그 만점이 넘는 그런 컬렉션을 가진 미술관이 되었습니다. 이건희 컬렉션 기증에 대해서 잠깐 말씀드리겠습니다. 이건희 컬렉션은 1,488점이고요. 246명의 작가들이 포함되어 있습니다. 아, 페인팅이 가장 많고 프린트 그리고 한국화 드로잉 그리고 어, 사진 비디오가 포함되어 있습니다. 아, 처음에 그 저희가 이제 미술관의 소장품의 그 기증 절차라든지 소장의 절차는 좀 
어, 다른 미술관에 이런 경우가 있는지 상당히 궁금한데요. 저희는 이제 조금 이런 것들이 진위 여부나 이런 것들에 굉장히 민감한 편입니다. 그래서 어, 기증 의사를 밝혀 오셨을 때 저희가 이제 뭐 미술관에서 실사를 했고요. 어, 그것에 대해서 어, 통상적인 그런 수집 그 심의 절차가 있습니다. 이 수집 심의 절차에는 어, 기존의 이제 다른 기증 작품과 달리 너무나 많은 대거 작품들이 들어오기 때문에 저희는 작품의 진품 확인서를 확보해야 되는 그런 상황이 있었습니다. 그래서 진품 확인서를 확보하기 위해서 저희가 실견을 하는 그 내부위원회 그리고 그 진위를 감정하는 감정위원들과 함께 실사를 했고요. 그리고 작품이 이제 4월에 동시에 또 마무리가 됐습니다. 그래서 1488점의 작품들을 어, 실견하고 어, 그것에 대한 진위 여부에 대한 판단 그리고 작품을 반입하는 것까지 이루어졌고 그 이후에 이제 여러분들께 소개가 되었습니다. 많은 작품이 반입되었지만 이 반입된 작품이 기증자의 뭐 물론 뭐 기증자 분들에게 여러 그 연구자들이 있지만 기증자는 미술품 전문가라든지 연구자가 아니기 때문에. 미술관에서 반입 이후에 또 별도의 그런 검수 작업이 이루어지고 그리고 세세한 정보에 대한 확인이 이어지고 있습니다. 뭐, 그, 뭐 짐작하시겠지만 아직까지 전혀 이제 마무리되지 않은 상태죠. 그래서 그 이건희 컬렉션은 상당히 많은 양이었고 우리가 그 한국 현대 회화에 대해서 특별히 더뭐 김은호라든지 이상범 그리고 어, 그 김기창이라든지 박래현, 그 변관식 이와 같은 한국현대미술사의 주요한 작가들의 작품들이 많이 포함되어 있었습니다. 그리고 한국의 대표적인 국민화가 박수근의 작품, 이중섭, 김한기, 저 그간의 미술관의 수집 예산으로는 전혀 그 구입을 엄두조차 내지 못했던 그런 작품들이 대거 포함되어 있었죠. 그리고 한국의 그 아주 희귀한 그런 그 근대 작가들의 작품들도 포함되어 있었습니다. 백남순 작가라든지 김창 어, 김종태 작가라든지 나혜석 작가 그리고 뭐그그 그 나혜석 작가의 진위를 판별할 수 있는 기준작이라든지 그리고 뭐 우리나라의 최초 여성화가의 작품 뭐 하나도 남겨지지 않은 것으로 알려졌던 그런 백남순 작가의 작품도 포함되어 있었습니다. 또 아주 희귀한 일이지만 그런 폴 고갱이라든지 샤갈 그리고 달리 그리고 피카소 이런 외국 작가 여덟 분의 119점의 작품도 포함되어 있었습니다. 자, 지금 보시는 것이 그 이상범 작가의 작품인데요. 100년 된 작품입니다. 아주 희귀한 청록 산수화이고요. 저희는 저희 미술관의 그 이상범의 작품에 대한 연대기를 끌어올린 작품이기도 합니다. 저희가 가지고 있는 건 1931년, 37년의 작품이었는데 이상범 초기에 그 청록 산수화가 포함되어 있었고요. 그리고 그 김기창의 군마도입니다. 저희도 미술관에서도 역시 기존의 군마도가 한점 포함되어 있었는데 이 작품은 56년에 5회 국전의 출품작으로서 그런 어떤 작품의 출처라든지 이런 것들이 좀 확실한 작품이었고요. 그리고 장욱진의 작품, 국전에 입상한 작품이고 장욱진을 화가로서의 길을 걷게 했던 그 미술관에서도 장욱진의 작품에서 연대기를 끌어올린 작품이기도 합니다. 이중섭의 소는 그동안 미술관에는 그 이중섭의 소가 한 점도 없었는데요. 이번에 흰소 그리고 황소가 다 포함되어 되게 되었습니다. 박수근 같은 작가의 경우는 대부분은 박수근 아주 소품 작품으로 알리 알려져 있는데 이번 그 기증품 중에서는 박수근의 대형 작품들이 많이 포함되어 있었습니다. 아까 말씀드린 그 우리나라 최초의 여성 화가 그 여러 그 중에 한 분인 그런 연대기를 끌어올린 작품이고 아, 이 작품은 사실 저와도 좀 각별히 인연이 있습니다. 제가 막그 근대를 묻다 2008년 전시를 했을 때이 아, 작품을 찾아서 굉장히 오랫동안 그 리움 삼성 측의 그런 그 대여를 타진했고 어, 특별히 기증자께서 이 작품 아끼셔서. 대여를 허락해 주셨지만 일주일에 한 번씩 그런 컨디션이라든지 이런 것들을 점검했던 기억이 납니다. 
아, 그리고 아주 대형 작품 김한기의 여인과 항아리 김한기의 그런 그 취향 김한기의, 김한기의 특성을 그런 총집합한 그런 도자기와 한국적인 모티브가 들어있는 작품이고요 그리고 샤갈, 르누아르 이런 작품들이 포함되어 있었습니다 잠깐 너무 많은 분들이 궁금해 하셔서 저희가 그 이건희 컬렉션이 어떻게 들어왔는지를 조금 그 이, 영상으로 보실 수 있도록 준비했습니다 많은 양의 작품들이 동시에 이동되었고 거기에서 분실이나 파손이 없었어야 했기 때문에 많은 인력들이 투입이 되었습니다. 그리고 작품을 포장하고 그리고 상차하고 하차하고 반입해서 수장고에 넣을 때까지 그런 것들이 전부 기록으로 남겨지게 되어 있습니다. 그리고 그래서 그 분실이나 파손이나 이런 것들 확인하기 위해서 끊임없이 계속 반복적으로 이런 수량 확인 작업이 이루어지게 됩니다. 사실 미술관의 수장고는 이미 상당히 포화 상태입니다. 저희가 2018년 12월에 청주관을 건립했고 지금 현재 대전 분관을 건립을 추진 중에 있지만 어, 많은 양의 작품들을 포화 소화하기는 좀 어렵죠. 그래서 어, 지속적으로 수장보 확보 그리고 뭐 작품의 수집도 동시에 이루어지지만 이런 문제들을 저희가 동시에 해결해야 할 것으로 어, 생각이 됩니다. 여기까지 보겠습니다. 그리고 다음 영상을 하나 더 준비했는데 그것까지 보시긴 좀 어려우실 것 같아서 넘어가겠습니다. 그 이건희 컬렉션에 대해서 아까 말씀드린 대로 1488점 그리고 246명의 작가 그리고 회화, 조각 이런 것들이 어느 정도로 분포되어 있는지 확인하실 수 있고요. 어, 한국에서 특히 관심 있는 작가들 유영국, 이중섭, 유강렬, 장옥진 같은 작가들의 작품이 어, 그런 순서대로 대거 들어왔습니다. 사실은 장, 유가, 유영국 같은 작품의 경우에는 그 187점이지만 22점의 유화 그리고 그 100... 그 제가 167점의 프린트가 포함되어 있습니다. 이 유화 같은 경우도 상당히 그 저희 미술관에 소장되어 있지 않았던 그런 작품들이 많이 포함되어 있어서 전반적으로 이건희 컬렉서의 기념의 기증을 통해서 저희 미술관이 추구해가 왔던 한국 현대 미술사, 한국 근현대 미술사의 정립 그런 것들을 어떻게 빠짐없이 소장할 것인가에 대해서 저희가 그간에 갈증이 많았는데 미술관의 그 적은 예산으로 구입하지 못한 작품들을 이번 기증을 통해서 확보하게 되었습니다. 
그래서 그 미술관의 그 이건희 컬렉션의 작품들을 보면 1950년대 이전의 작품들이 320점이 되어 있고요. 전체에서 22%입니다. 상대적으로 그 저희가 소장하기가 어려운 작품들이 많이 포함되어 있고 이로 인해서 이제 근대 미술에 대한 연구가 강화될 수 있다고 생각이 됩니다. 미술관의 그 이건희 컬렉션 기증을 통해서 미술관의 작품 수 언제 우리가 1만 점을 소장하게 되는 미술관이 될 것인가 고민했는데 단번에 1만 점이 넘는 미술관이 됐고요. 그리고 다양한 작가 그리고 다양한 세대를 세대를 아우르고 그뭐그 시공을 아우르는 그런 작가들의 작품이 소장되게 되었습니다. 또 하나 특이할 만한 것은 어, 이건희 컬렉션이 1488점 기증되었고 작년에 총 2134점의 작품이 수집이 되었는데 2000점이 넘는 작품을 소, 기증을 통해서 받아, 소장하게 되었습니다. 네, 600점이 넘는 작품들을 그 이건희 컬렉션 외에 그 다른 개인 작가들 그리고 개인 소장가를 통해서 어, 확보하게 되었는데 어, 이러한 기증 문화 활성화에도 많은 기여를 해주신 것으로 생각이 됩니다. 이건희 컬렉션에 대한 관심이 폭증하면서 많은 분들이 빠른 공개를 요청하셨습니다. 아, 사실 소장품 자료관리과 국립현대미술관 53년의 역사 속에 평균적으로 200점 정도, 연평균 200점 정도를 소장하게 되었는데 작년에 한 번에 2134점, 그러니까 기존에 소장됐던 작품 수의 한 10배가 넘는 그런 작품 수를 소장하게 되어서 저희가 대폭 인력을 지원받았습니다. 관내에서 큐레이터 그룹을 4명 정도 지원받았고 외부에서 13명의 인력들을 보강해서 17명의 인력이 팀을 꾸렸고 이것들을 통해서 작품 촬영이라든지 저작권 확보 그리고 이런 것들을 빠른 공개를 위한 조사 연구가 이루어졌습니다. 아, 계속해서 이제 사실 많은 분들이 공개를 요청하고 계신데 저희가 저작권 그런 촬영이 되었더라도 저작권 확보를 이용 하락서 확보를 통해서만 공개할 수 있기 때문에 아, 조금 기다려 주시면 저희가 빠른 속도로 공개해 드리도록 하겠습니다. 이건희 컬렉션에 대한 지자체의 관심도 뜨거웠습니다. 그래서 이건희 컬렉션 거, 기증관 걸린 문제와 맞물려서 각 지자체에서 이건희 컬렉션 미술관을 짓고자 하였습니다. 그래서 이런 것들의 요구는 저희 미술관에서 뭐 수용하기가 좀 어렵지만 그래도 이건희 컬렉션이 빠르게 지역에서도 공개될 수 있도록 저희가 그런 그 순회전을 계획하였습니다. 미술관에서 작년에부터 지금 작년 7월, 4월에 반입되었고 작년 7월부터 첫 번째 이건희 컬렉션 특별전이 열렸고요. 그리고 덕수궁에서 박수근 개인전, 회고전을 통해서 박수근 작품이 소개가 되었습니다. 그리고 미술관에 지금 현재 열리고 있는 생애 찬미 전에도 이건희 컬렉션이 대개 소, 대거 소개되었고 이중섭전 지금 열리고 있죠. 그리고 올 하반기에 그, 그 열리게 되는 이건희 컬렉션 전시 과천과 청주에서도 예정되어 있습니다. 그리고 해외에서도 이건희 컬렉션 전시가 열릴 예정인데요. 어, 명칭은 좀 다릅니다. 한국 근대 매술전이고 이건희 컬렉션이 대거 포함되어 있는 전시가 라크마에서 이제 곧 다음 주에 개가 개막을 하게 되고요. 그리고 얼마 전에 끝났죠. 일요일에 일요일 지난 일요일에 끝난 중앙박물관의 어느 수집가의 초대에서도 소개를 드린 바 있습니다. 아, 권진규 회고전에 그리고 어, 이미 종료된 건진구 해교전이 있었고 경기도 뮤지엄 그리고 광주 시립미술관 부산 시립미술관이 올 하반기에 소개할 예정이고 내년도에 그 전남도립 미술관 울산 시립미술관 등총전 그 전국적으로 1 0개 미술관에서 이건희 컬렉션 전시가 예정되어 있습니다. 사실은 이건희 컬렉션이 얼마나 많은 영향을 주었는지 저희 미술관의 컬렉션 뭐잘 아시겠지만 저희 미술관은 소장품이 단한 점도 없이 출발한 미술관입니다. 
그리고 1972년에 한국 근대미술 60년 전을 계기로 어, 미술관의 근대미술품 1900년 이후에 미술, 한국 현대미술에 집중돼서 어, 소장이 되게 되었습니다. 그리고 1986년에 과천관을 오픈을 계기로 그 2만여 평의 전시실을 낼 채, 야외 조각장을 포함해서 이 전시실을 채울 수 있는 빠른 컬렉션의 확보가 필요했죠. 그래서 저희가 그 올림픽이라든지 아시안 게임과 같은 국가적인 행사와 더불어서 해외 작가들의 작품들을 대폭 소장하게 되었고 한국의 근현대 미술사의 작품들도 꾸준히 소장하게 고 있습니다. 그리고 다시 98년에 덕수궁을 근대 미술 전문관으로 제 개관하게 되었죠. 2013년에 서울관을 오픈하면서 조금 더 다양한 매체, 다양한 장르, 다양한 작가들의 작품의 소장이 가능해졌습니다. 그리고 2018년에 청주관을 오픈하였고 2024년 말 25년을 목표로 대전관을 건립을 추진 중입니다. 아, 그 단한 점도 없는 미술관 컬렉션을 72년에 시작했지만 아, 지금 이제 현재는 그 1만 958점 오늘 현재 1만 958점까지 지금 그 소장을 하게 됐고요. 어, 70년대 저희가 어떻게 소장하게 됐는지 좀 보시면 어, 대부분 주요한 전시를 계기로 소장하게 됐습니다. 60년에 대한 그런 전시들 그래서 잘 보, 보시는 그런 고희동 김종태, 이중섭, 그리고 권진규 등의 작품들이 포함되어 있습니다. 당시에는 미술관의 전문 그런 그 인력이 확보되지 않은 시점이었기 때문에 행정직 관장이 개인 자문의 형식으로 이런 것들 컬렉션들을 확보하게 되었고 전문위원들이 이런 컬렉션을 하는데 많이 기여를 해주셨죠. 그리고 그 80년대 저희가 과천을 개관하면서 전문인 관장님들을 모시고 이제 그 본격적인 그 작품 수집 관리 규정이라든지 작품 수집 위원회가 발족하게 됩니다. 아, 작품 수집 관리 규정 한 90년대 이후에 좀 드러나게 되는데 80년대 후반기부터 지금 저희가 그 아시안 게임이라든지 올림픽을 계기로 해외 미술 작품들이 대거 소장이 되었고 그리고 그 지금 이 시기가 이경성 관장님, 김세준 관장님, 그리고 이명방 관장님, 그리고 오광수 관장님 매 시기로 이어지면서 그런 그 해외 미술과 한국 미술의 교류 그런 그런 가운데서 한국 미술사를 어떻게 정립할 것인가에 대한 관심이 특히 많았던 시기라고 할수 있습니다. 2000년대 이후에 이제 한국 현대 미술에 대한 관심들 그리고 한국 현대 미술사 어떻게 볼 것인가 그래서 전환과 역동의 시대라든지 뭐그 단색화전이라든지 이런 전시를 통해서 한국 현대 미술의 70년대, 80년대를 좀 메꾸는 그러한 그 소장이 이루어졌고 그 여러 가지 그 미술관의 그런 소장품의 수집이 좀 확대된 그런 시기라고 할수 있습니다. 이런 것들은 저희가 사실 이제 그 국가 예산에 의존하는 미술관으로서 기증 외에는 작품을 구입을 통해서 확보하게 되는데 미술관의 구입 예산이 대폭 확대된 것도 중요한 역할을 했다고 볼수 있겠습니다. 2010년은 더 서울관 개관과 맞물려서 다양한 매체, 다양한 장르, 다양한 국적의 작가들의 작품을 소장하게 된 시기이기도 합니다. 지금 이제 매체별로 보시면 한그 회화 작품이 당연히 많고요. 그리고 한국 미술관으로서 한국에 대한 그런 관심, 그리고 사진 작품 이런 것들이 있죠. 그리고 적지만 디자인이나 공예, 건축, 그리고 서예 작품들도 소, 소장이 점진적으로 늘어나고 있는 상황입니다. 그리고 매체별로 저 미술관에서 종합 미술관으로서 한국 미술관 한국 미술사 정립 외에 그런 소외 장르의 활성화라든지 이런 것들에 대한 많은 요구가 있기 때문에 미술관은 특별전을 통해서 그런 그 그런 그 마이너 장르에 대한 관심 그리고 그런 것들에 대한 소장을 좀 늘려가고 있는 추세입니다. 어, 회화 작품들이 최근에는 전체적으로는 그 한국화나 회화 작품이 많지만 최근에는 좀 줄어드는 추세이고요. 마이너 장르에 대한 그런 이런 디자인이라든지 건축 
서예, 공예 등의 작품의 소장이 점점 늘어나고 있습니다. 지금 보시면 빨간색이 기증 작품이고요. 어, 파란색이 저희가 구입을 통해서 이루어진 것입니다. 그래서 2000년, 2010년 이후에 뉴미디어의 소장은 대부분 저희가 그 구입을 통해서 이루어지고 있음을 알수 있습니다. 어, 해외 작품 내 소장도 있지만 전체적으로 보면 상당히 미미한 편입니다. 꾸준히 저희가 그, 그 한국 미술사의 정립이라는 것이 한국 미술 하나만으로 해결되는 것이 아니기 때문에 세계 미술사 속에 한국 미술사를 포지셔닝하는 것이 저의 역할이기도 하고 주요한 해외 작가들의 작품 그것과의 관계 그런 것들도 저희가 꾸준히 연구하고자 합니다. 그래서 어, 보시면 1930년, 40년대 이전 작가들의 작품이 대폭 어, 소장되어 있고요. 어, 단색화라든지 실험 미술 뭐 이런 작가들까지겠죠. 저희가 지금 보시면 어, 그 이후의 작가들의 작품에 대해서는 어, 앞으로도 늘려나갈 계획입니다. 그리고 그 작품의 작품 자체 제작 연도를 보면 80년대, 90년대 이전이 훨씬 더 많고요. 그리고 어, 가장 전시를 많이 하는 작품 그리고 대여 요청이 많은 작품 역시 백남준, 서세옥, 이중섭, 김한기 이런 작가들의 작품이 되겠습니다. 아, 그래서 미술, 한국 미술사를 어떻게 정립할 것인가 한국 미술사의 정립을 어떻게 확대할 것인가 이런 것들에 대해서 계속 연구 중이고 저희가 다양한 시기 그리고 다양한 매체 다양한 지역의 작가들의 작품을 포함시키고자 합니다 그리고 다양한 담론들 그런 것들을 저희 컬렉션 안에 포함시키려고 노력하고 있고요 저희가 지금 오늘 소개해드린 것은 그 소장품에 대한 소개이지만 저희가 아카이브 를 47만 점 확보하고 있고 이런 것들도 저희가 디지털화를 통해서 홈페이지를 통해서 검색하실 수가 있습니다. 그래서 저희는 미술관에서는 이러한 소장품을 통한 한국 미술사의 정립 또 세계 미술사와의 교류 이런 것뿐 아니라 다양한 미술사적인 연구를 자료로서 아카이브를 좀 확충하고 있고 어, 지금 저희가 추진 중이지만 이런 아, 미술관의 소장품 검색 시스템 그리고 뭐 미술관의 아카이브 검색 시스템 뿐만 아니라 미술관에서 생산하는 미술관의 기록 관리 시스템 이런 것들을 연동하고 또 공개함으로써 한국 미술사에 대한 연구 그런 것들을 조금 더 어, 활성화하는 데 저희가 기여하고자 합니다. 아, 네. 저의 발표는 여기까지 마치겠습니다. 안녕하세요. Hello. Um, thank you for that great introduction. My name is Victoria Siddle. Um, I'm non-executive director of Freeze, uh, previously global director of the Freeze Fairs, and was very happy to announce one year ago that Freeze would be coming to Seoul. Um, and obviously that's brought many of us together here this week, um, which I'm delighted to see and very excited for the fair to open alongside Kiev tomorrow. Um, I'm also co-founder and trustee of the Gallery Climate Coalition um, and chair the board of Studio Voltaire in London. Um, I want to thank CAMS for organizing this conference today um, and, uh, and for inviting me to chair this panel on collecting for the future, public and private. I'm very honored to be speaking with such a prestigious panel of speakers um, and really looking forward to our conversation. Um, I know some of you have been introduced, but just to recap, um, Maria Balshaw, uh, director of Tate in the UK, which spans two museums in London, plus spaces in Liverpool and in St. Ives. Maria has run Tate since 2017. Uh, she's also chair of the National Museum Directors Council and is a trustee of the Manchester International Festival. Um, in 2015, she was awarded a CBE by the Queen for services for the arts. Um, Caroline Bourgeois, Chief Curator of the Pinot Collection, um, which is shown primarily in the Bourse de Commerce in Paris, as well as the Palazzo Grassi and the Punta della de Ghana in Venice. And prior to this, she was Artistic Director of the FRAC Ile de France, um, so she has experience of curating and leading both private and public institutions. And Higgin Kim, um, an entrepreneur and collector based here in Seoul, 
Uh, he's the chairman and CEO of Byuksan Engineering and shows over 400 of his works from his own collection um, at the company headquarters in Seoul. He's also chairman of the Korea Mecenat Association and is on the board of CAMS. Um, the presentations that we've heard today already have given us a great insight into fantastic public and private collections um, and the importance of both on our, in our cultural life. Um, it was very interesting to hear all three of the presentations talk about how their collecting strategy has changed over the last couple of years in terms of diversifying their collections and broadening their audiences. Um, I'd like to start with um, Higgin Kim because we haven't heard from you yet. Um, you have over a thousand works in your collection, I believe, um, and you've chosen to show over 400 of these works publicly in your offices. Um, in a recent interview with the Financial Times, which I enjoyed very much, um, you said that art works like a tenderizer on people. Um, could you tell us a little about your collection and about what inspired you to start collecting contemporary art? Now we have heard the institutional collections and uh, you can see the differences from England, uh, English museums, French museums and Korean museums. Uh, I hate to say the details but uh, you can feel the differences. Our history as uh, Ms. Park mentioned is only about 53 years old. Our National Museum has of course, a handful of uh, artists, Korean artists, studied in Japan and France long before the World War II. They came back and uh, they were deadly poor, actually. And we didn't even have any respect whatsoever for the artist. But nevertheless, uh, they were praised and recognized later after the war. So Korean art history is very, very short. Exhibition is even shorter, and collection is much, much shorter. So we are the first generation, I'm 76 years old, and uh, we are the first generation of uh, whatever you want to call collecting or purchasing some artworks with your own money. In Korea, we have uh, several different parts of uh, collectors. Some collectors, but, uh, they establish foundation, just like any other country, and the foundation has their own uh, private museums. And it's growing, but then already early ones already faced uh, financial problems, and they have to start to sell museums to maintain. So that's the poor example. So it's something we have to learn too. Others, it's all institutional. It's out of uh, our own uh, pay, the tax. As Ms. Park explained, our, we have a budget of National Museum, about $50 million. And acquisition budget is only about less than 10%. We got a lot of donations, but the private donation is all, all mostly by the artist, not the collectors. Connie Lee is the first collect, uh, collection direct at the donations. And recently, there is another one. They're going to have an exhibition sometime in November. It's, uh, uh, gallerist, it's an elderly gallerist, uh, collect, concentrated on the traditional oriental art. He donated about hundred some uh, pieces, and it's going to be the first the largest collector's donation. I hope this will just start and uh, uh, expand it. But then we have uh, the biggest issue is. Our institutional have a very difficult procedures of uh, accepting a donation, and also tax department is a really pain. As you probably know, we we had so much difficult time and big issues about 
accepting Egonis collection. And it, it tri triggered the issue and the problems of the collections and donations. So hopefully at the end of the year, or early, early next year, our great parliament will just pass the uh, law. What I have done and some of my colleagues has done was just acquiring uh, artworks. Of course, we all studied when we were young. We studied with the lithographs, silk screens, and things like that. Hundred dollars, thousand dollars, always like anything else, it just grows up. You started uh, drinking $10 wine and then later $50, $200 and it goes up to $1,000. It's about the same thing as the uh, artwork collection. I personally collect arts because I liked it. I made half decent money. I saved half decent money long before the collection, but there, where I lived over a decade, there was nothing to buy. It was in the middle of desert, in the in 70s in Saudi Arabia. So only, only thing I could buy or consume my little wealth I had was a Persian carpet. Then later we came, I came back. And during that time, I traveled around the world so many times and then visited the different museums and impressed me a lot. But what can I do? I mean, this, uh, you know, all very... Uh, precious and valuable paintings and artworks. So whatever I could afford, I always still do that. I make a budget, an annual budget to acquire the artworks and I buy to enjoy myself. And uh, collecting and enjoying myself, which means myself, my kins, and my company employees, and after that is, if our company people, if my employee appreciate the artworks and enjoy uh, living with it, then why shouldn't we expand it to other companies? That's what Masena is doing. It's an art and business. It's a, in America, they call it art and business. In Korea, we call it Masena. So we expand it. We try to persuade a lot of the owners of the large corporates who do not have the private museums. But instead, I, have, I moved to the new office of some about 15 years ago just simply because they have a firewall in the middle of the, each floor. There you can hang about two meters by three meters large size paintings. And there's at the beginning, my employee was wondering what the devil's that is, and there's plenty of things over there, but I displayed every room, every floor, not only in my office, but uh, all the six floors of the office, uh, they hang the different uh, paintings or the sculptures in the corridor. And they, they changed. We, we, actively change those sort of things every half years. So I have, in the, in the building, I have about huge warehouse or storage. So we exchange things like that. And then several years ago, about five years ago, one of our cultural building, public buildings, uh, asked me to whether I wanted to do the collector's exhibition. So I said, why not? And they paid for the deliveries and the insurance, so they exhibited it. And then two years later, there was another one. It's a beautiful place in Yosu, Yeul Maul, just uh, Caltex, and the city uh, runs the cultural center. It's a just a wonderful place. They took it. The curator normally comes and uh, selects uh, whatever they want to exhibit out of about 1,000 some uh, items. Yosu, the special one was that they selected about 40 of icons, Catholic icons, which is very rare in Korea. 
So there was exhibitions, and the next year, I think some other uh, city museum wants to do that. And I'm more than willing to share. I enjoy it, and I want my people to enjoy it, and that expense to anywhere else. I'm not an art historian or a curator. I don't know much about arts, but you know, it's art itself is a very strong means of communication to others. So I communicate with my employee with the arts, and they become very knowledgeable as well. I got hundreds of close to above a thousand books, manuals, or catalogs of uh, each painters, and some of them are friends. I start to buy Western paintings, actually. Nowadays, very recent, about five years since I've been working for the government, uh, I started to uh, encourage to buy Korean artists and try to promote Korean artists to the world. And as the previous speaker said, uh, art, is, art has to be global. I don't care about Korean artists and you know Korean market or anything like that, but it's a communication. We speak English, French, whatever the language, but it's the same thing with the arts. Another changes I have had is not only concentrated in Korean artists, but I got bored with the two dimensions, paintings. Then start to look at it. We go Venice Biennale almost every time, every two years. And I go to Basel I'm, as I'm a committee member. You can see the differences of market. And uh, start to, the, one of the first one I bought was a Cohen's, Australian lady at my age, and with the uh, fluorescent lighting and the mirrors. I bought it at Basel. Then later, Philip Areno, the boys from Mars, and then to Olafa Eliasson, the models, the glass balls and lightings, holograms, sculptures, Thomas Saraceno, networks. Now that, that really, yesterday I went to Esther Schaefer and there's a Ryan Gander hologram. Small dinky one, but it's about 25,000 pounds. I said, I'll think about it. So th there are different things showing, and uh, I appreciate the you know, creativity of the artist. Higgin, I think you've now answered all the questions that I was going to ask you throughout this talk. So that was a very, very efficient first answer. Thank you. Um, and I will say that I think your reasons for buying art, which are your personal enjoyment and then sharing that with other people, um, are very admirable. So thank you for that. Um, Caroline, I wanted to ask you, um, of course, the Pino Collection is a private collection um, that's put on some of the best museum shows in Europe. For example, you mentioned the recent uh, Marlene Dumas show in Venice, which you curated, and which I think was on many people's list of the top shows in Venice, including mine. Um, the Pino Collection has, of course, the three spaces in Venice and Paris. Can you speak about the role of the collection and these private museums in these cities and how they differ from the role of uh, public institutions? Uh, first, we had 15 minutes normally to present our collection, <laughs> so I went as fast as I could. <laughs> but I didn't mention that we complementary. For example, David Hammond's, it's very rare in any public collection. Marlene Dumas is not in any public collection in France. So we're really complementary. And we have the, the, we can allow ourselves to make decisions with younger generation. We don't, it, it, and it's always Francois Pinot who makes the final decision. So we can be quite quick to be in the, in the younger or like uh, Martha Wilson, she's not younger, she was not recognized at all. Uh, so it's uh, 
uh, I, I, we see it as a complementary, uh, not as a competition, the opposite. And we did a common show, Bobo and Us, with Charles Ray, for example, and it was on the same date of opening, same date. Um, we, and we will never have a modern collection. We can't make, like you do, uh, a different kind of perspective going through more than 60 years or for a museum more than 100 or 200. This is not our goal. We are concerned by sharing, exchanging. That's why we have that um, um, loan process, which is very open. Um, and to, again, to think in a com complementary way. I think that's a really interesting and important point, actually, is the, the role that private collections and particularly museums can have in complementing what public institutions are doing and the different kind of approach, but also perhaps flexibility that they have in, um, in sort of adding to the cultural landscape. Um, the gift uh, from the Samsung family that we heard about from Young Ren Park at MMCA um, continues a great tradition um, that's taken place throughout history all over the world, uh, which is public museum collections being founded on private collections that are gifted to the state. Um, also the case for Tate, of course, uh, which benefited from the donation of Henry Tate's collection in 1932. Um, Maria, I wondered if you could talk about uh, the importance of private collections um, in building museum collections and how you see this role evolving in the future. Yes, well, it, it follows on very nicely from um, what Caroline was just saying. Um, I think, um, I mean, as Victoria observes, uh, most museums, uh, uh, most public museums have at their foundation um, collections that either came from the crown of the country um, or came from um, the wealthy individuals that helped expand and grow that country. And so... Henry Tate is just one example amongst many, many individual philanthropists who helped found what we now regard in the UK as our public collections. I came from Manchester before I came to Tate and the great regional museums in the UK are all made up of collections that were assembled by men and occasionally women who made their fortunes in the 19th century and had a sense of civic duty um, they did not believe that um, they uh, should hold on to those collections only for their own pleasure. So just as you were talking about, um, there has been, for I think for at least a century, a desire to um, share the benefit of their personal enjoyment of art and their accumulation of wealth. Um, and so for us now at Tate, it is still the case that there are individuals um, who give single works or sometimes large bodies of collections because they share our values and our commitment to public benefit. Now, not all collectors have that and they, there's no reason that they should. Um, it is a perfectly good enough situation to wish to collect art for it to be in your living room or your dining room or your office or your home. But there are many collectors whose passion about what they do means that very quickly, as they start to build a collection, they start to think about how could it be seen um, um, and how could it be enjoyed in perpetuity uh, by the public. So for us at Tate, the most recent example of that uh, is um, a large body of works which came into the collection this year past from um, a long-term friend of Tate, um, uh, a Greek-born collector called Dimitris Daskalopoulos. And I think when Dimitri began collecting, um, he was doing it for his own exploration and curiosity. His taste and interest took him toward um, what the art world was creating in the 1980s and 90s, which at that time was very often in the found space or a warehouse space, a non-museum space. So his collection became typified by works that are definitely not for hanging above your mantelpiece. <laughs> they are room-sized or hall-sized or for outdoor. Um, and so I think quite a long time ago, he started with a conversation with himself and with his curators and advisors about how these works might um, find a future life in a public museum. And it was that inspiration that drove his wish to donate, not just to Tate, but also to the Guggenheim and to MCA in Chicago and to help the building of the new Museum of Contemporary Art in Athens. So there's a 
very, very old-fashioned philanthropic desire to create a wider social benefit. And when there is that sharing of values um, between the private collection and individual and the public mission, I think there can be a very um, mutually beneficial arrangement. No private collection should be given to an institution with the idea that that individual could dictate what the public museum does. Because, of course, the public museum's mission is driven by the needs of the public. But it has been my experience that for many individuals who, as you have done, have fallen deeply in love with the, um, the art that they are able to acquire and explore, they share values and they wish to share that public mission. And um, the great thing about most public museums, and certainly it is the case in the UK, we hold our collections in perpetuity. So I cannot predict um, nor control uh, what will happen with Dimitri's collection in 50 years' time or 100 years' time, but I do know that it will still be there and being used, which is a very good um, benefit, I think, for an individual wishing to be philanthropic. Um, and on that subject, Francois Pino has said, um, sharing with the public the questions that art raises and asks us. This is the very sense of the cultural project I've initiated. Um, Caroline, I'm curious to know just a little more about uh, Francois Pino's motivations in sharing his collections, because I think it's important to remember he doesn't have to, you know, there is no obligation. <laughs> um, and um, it just, I think it's interesting just to understand a little more deeply, like what drove him to, you know, to invest so much in making his collection public. Well, uh, he started as a self-made person, and same with art. Uh, and he's, I think he, uh, he felt that art can help uh, people to change point of view, to exchange, to change, uh, for example, David Hammond 35 years ago. It was a lot before he had the attention he has now. So a big concern as a humanist uh, perspective. It happened that he decided to uh, make a space. It was first in 2000, supposed to be in 2002 uh, or three in Paris. There were a lot of problems. Uh, it, it's, and we worked as like three people. We were not at all a big team. It became uh, a project. It, uh, Venice started to happen and uh, it's, it's he wants to share, and he's convinced that it's a, a kind of a democratic point of view with the risk of art, and that the art can help us to, uh, to share, to understand the differences. Uh, and the collection is quite engaged in terms of uh, people in the collection, as well as the way we show them or we share. And we are quite, um, there's a lot of a pedagogical program. <laughs> in Venice as well as in Paris. Uh, and in that sense, uh, we are very aware of the public. This is for the others. This is not for our name or anything like that. Uh, that's why we do, like Marlene, we, did, we worked a lot on the pedagogical uh, uh, guide. And uh, I hope you could felt that the, the opening show was very engaged regarding different voices uh, from different uh, continents even. Um, and that was also um, uh, something he's very attentive to. Um, and in the way of collecting, I may not have had the time, but we go together to the, a lot to the studios. It's a very engaged part. And uh, in terms of international collection, uh, I think he's the only one who agreed to sign the opening show and to be involved with all what he does. Uh, so uh, just to, to, to allow the others to, to be in love with art, it's more to allow the others in a way. To allow people to be in love with art, I think, again, <laughs> great, uh, a great takeaway from this conversation. Um, uh, Marie, you mentioned civic duty, and um, Higgin, you were talking about the Mycenae Association um, that I believe you founded, and it's sort of, uh, you know, it's, its role in encouraging companies and individuals um, to be philanthropic and to, um, uh, to ensure that art is there for everybody. I'm wondering, what is it that motivates people to do that in your experience? What individual can do 
and the institution can do, but there are edges of what corporates can do. That's what it is about the Mesana. It's, it's, you're all professionals here with the arts, but uh, I'm an entrepreneur, and most important thing is my happiness. Korea has been struggling for the last seven years. Some years ago, it was a, almost starved to death. It's, so well-being is a new word to us. Happiness, good God, I mean, what is this? I mean, there was a really devastating uh, stage when I was young. No, I mean, worse than Berlin or anywhere else. Then finally we got independent, and then within five years, North Korea came down. No, Russian, I mean, German, I mean, Chinese. And so we, we went all through that, and uh, we started to build, uh, you no, know, we did, had a good leader to industrialize our country. And it's very recent that we start to talk about good life, talk about visual arts, collections, wow, gastronomy, good wine, classical musics. This is all very, very new, and we have a lot to learn from you people. I mean, this honest God, I mean, it's truth. That's a reality. You've seen the presentation of our bureaucracy here. So, what COPRA can do is, for example, we adopted a new program last year with the help of uh, Mr. Shim, this organization. Uh, we asked the medium-sized gallery to nominate their artist, which they normally don't have any, just exhibition by exhibition, but they went except Kukje, Hyundai, and Ghana, and a few others. So we did that, and the government started to pay $100 a month. No, $1,000, I'm sorry. $1,000 a month, and the gallery pays uh, $500 a month to those uh, artists. And we, the year before, it was about 94 altogether selected, and about 20 of them we evaluated and had an exhibition free of charge, which cost a lot of money, but we had it at the Seoul uh, Art Center. And I put the spoon on top of that and the Mesena. I ex explained to Mesena members that this is a very wise and right thing to do to help the artists not only buying the artworks, but pay at least about $5,000 over every month, uh, every year next three years. We started that, and then everybody paid for the first two years, and then bought the uh, artworks. I personally bought it. And the others used the copyrights and their own terms with the companies. Another one we started to do that this year was, of course, that will go on every year. In October, was it? October, we're going to have another exhibition, and uh, many more companies going to uh, accompany us. Another one we have done this year, early this year, was uh, turned out to be a success. Was uh, it was uh, Ben Cliven the piano con the contest in Texas, and uh, we as we decide to help four candidates first. Uh, audited uh, artists, and uh, all four of them out of uh, 400, no, 397 candidates got to semifinal. And then the first prize was the youngest one, 18 years old, Mr. Lim. He got the first prize. So that was the same condition. The corporates helped them and paid the, all the airplane tickets and hotels and all that. And all four of them, and the one got first prize. Then he already have a, you know, billions of backups. I mean, the help donators. So that's gonna go on, on. We're going to have a five 
different contests. Uh, second one in September is uh, Indianapolis, uh, the strings, violins and cello. So those sort of things the company can do comfortably. It's an expensive account, and uh, we help them about $10,000 each year, and uh, we help them make a trip safe and things like that. This is what Masana does. That's Thank great. You. It's very um, admirable, and congratulations on everything you've achieved. Um, I wanted to talk just in the last five minutes about, um, as we're talking about sharing collections, um, talk about digital and um, how this can be used to reach audiences, particularly younger audiences or audiences in parts of the world who don't have the same access to art in person. Um, I was thinking of an example this week. I went to see the Hito Styles show at the MNCA, which is fantastic if you haven't seen it. Um, on Monday afternoon, it was packed with young people. And I thought, this is amazing, you know, where, where, you know how do they all know about this? Uh, someone told me that um, RM from BTS had made a TikTok in the Hito style show, and, and that had driven huge young audiences to come and see the exhibition, which is great. Um, I just wondered, as a, you know, sort of open question to the panel, just how you see digital kind of impacting the way we reach audiences in the future, and what, if anything, we've learned over the last couple of years, when, of course, we couldn't all see art in person, and the ways that digital can enable that. Maria, do you want to <laughs> go I'm first? I'm happy to start. I also have a TikTok example. Um, as art is made in the world, and visual artists will use the same kinds of technologies that the audiences are using. So whether you want to um, be engaged or not, you will be, because we operate in a broader cultural field. Um, ever more so, I think, since social media has made so many of our means of communications visually led. I mean, it was the Instagram generation is an underestimate of just how much our language has shifted toward the visual. Um, so we did all sorts of um, authored experiments, if you like, during the lockdown period, um, and we had to. Um, we were closed, our, in, our four institutions were closed with three days' notice from the government. We had just opened an Andy Warhol show. We had hundreds of thousands of T-shirts that we wanted to sell in our shops. <laughs> And we then had eight months of locked down, dead time, where those weren't going to shift unless we learnt at speed to do things differently. So on literally the last day that um, anyone was allowed to move around London, my amazing tiny team of people got themselves into the exhibition and turned it into a virtual exhibition with the curator working at speed with the social media team. And that meant that that exhibition could be seen by the sponsors who wanted to use it to cheer up their workers who were stuck at home. It's like Bank of America, EY, they were very, very, help, very, very grateful for that cultural benefit. But more importantly, it allowed us to connect to an international audience who then could connect to our online shop, which was still open. So we shifted some of the T-shirts. Um, and we, we had um, the uh, Congolese artist, uh, Faustin uh, Linda Kula, who had been with us for um, several weeks, practicing a dance performance that was to take place in the tanks. Again, last week running up to the lockdown, we knew we were not going to be able to gather hundreds of people in an enclosed concrete tank. Um, <laughs> he was actually very unfazed and said, in my country, we have been living with war conditions for the past decade. You just change how you do things. So he and the dancers made the work as a performance for online, and it became a world premiere that was shared all across the globe at that moment when everyone was dying to see something. But my final example is um, how interesting it is sometimes when you don't do things. So after the third lockdown uh, in the UK, uh, again, a long one. We were building up towards a summer reopening with Heather Phillipson's remarkable commission for the Devines Galleries. Now, image rich, screens all the way down each side of the, uh, the very large gallery spaces on the floor, a dystopian science fiction universe um, with a burnt peach sunrise right at the end. And just as you say, Victoria, after a week or so, we noticed there were an unusually large number of young people coming in. To begin with, we thought this was because everyone had been locked up for so long, they're just desperate to be out and be social, and it's a very, very, 
visually um, and physically engaging piece. Then one of the younger visitor assistants observed that uh, what was going on was that young people were coming into, particularly the burnt peach sunrise, to make their own TikToks. And it had gone wild on TikTok, not authored by us, but authored by our audience. And to me, that is the world we're in now. And it's almost more interesting when it's led by the people who come, who then connect to their own peers and communities who we would not reach ourselves. Uh, I'll speak briefly because I know we're running absolutely out of time. Uh, of course, we have Instagram, blah, 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 blah. It's part of, uh, it's part of our, our today's world. And we did things on Zoom to be with others uh, alive without being alive, etc. But I have to really say that uh, not experience is physical. And uh, I'm a bit afraid of the effect of the Instagram. I call now some works Instagram works, uh, which is, uh, on my point of view, a little bit dangerous. So it's quite, uh, I mean, I, I would push to have Instagram communic communication in general around, not uh, directly about. And we do program uh, things specifically on music and dance and things like that with a very different kind of generation, which is more about. So to make an equilibrium, uh, and we're not yet in having asked an artist to make an Instagram <laughs> project. I think that's a very good point. Of course, you know, one thing the last two years did teach us is that art really is meant to be seen in person and you can't really replace that kind of experience of being physically present with an artwork. But of course, to your examples, Maria, the power of digital to drive audiences to visit those museums and collections um, can be very powerful. Um, I feel like we could talk ab about this for hours and I hope to continue conversations with you individually. Um, but we need to wrap up now. So thank you so much to our panel. Um, thank you to the audience. And in Higgins' words, um, I hope this art week in Seoul brings all of you much joy, um, as well as to many other thousands of people. Thank you. Thank you.